Ops, and he's written one of the best review articles available. Uh, his lab focuses on AMD and photoreceptor transduction pathways, and uh, the residents have noted that even on Saturdays and Sundays, he's usually here long before we are, so he's considered one of the hardest working uh, faculty that we've come across. So, uh, and Dr. Degree would like to just do a quick introduction to the, to the talk uh, as well. melanopsin, but I think the importance of this talk is that it's actually what has melanopsin got to do with your life? Uh, and I think I hope by the end of this talk that you'll uh, understand the, um, how melanopsin is really changing the way we think about certain conditions in ophthalmology, but also how it affects our lives. And you can't imagine my uh, absolute delight when uh, Ng Ben Fu joined the faculty because um, we had been interested in melanopsin as um, uh, a transducer of information to the brainstem and uh, participating in photophobia. And, uh, and here he came with one of the very best reviews ever written on this topic. And so I went, we have got to do grand rounds sometime, but it's taken us about three years to get our act together uh, to get us both in the same place. So uh, Ing Ben, we're thrilled that you could join us today. My voice okay? Yeah. So, um, I think this is my first grand round presentation. And uh, also, most of the time, I'm talking with the PhD, but I can tell you, I am excited to present in front of more than MDs, but working really on the front line, fighting with eye diseases. So, what I'm going to do, to, uh, to do today is to give you a review about current understanding about the specific photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And Kathleen is going to talk about some really fascinating work about the function implication of these cells, especially this kind of uh, photophobia in migraines. So our visual system performs two essential functions. And one is so-called image formation, which is most people are familiar with. The other is So the question is, are these two functions performed by the same part of photoreceptor? And the search for the novel action of photoreceptor really starts in the field of beginning biology. It is known in the field that all organisms have an internal pulse, <coughs> and this is very important to control your neurophysiological function. And it has roughly a 24 hour cycle. And in order for the internal force to be useful, it needs to be entrained to the donor day at also 24 hour cycle. And it's also known that the most important visual cue to set the internal force is the daily change of growth amount of night or irradiance at dawn and dusk. So you can already immediately say, they perform a function very different from the traditional and the rod and cone function that they need to form it. So the eyes are obviously essential for the each as the interface between the environment or the donor day and the preceding source. Because there's lots of evidence that this involves animal models, human patients, after the removal of the dark eye. And also, it's 
I think uh, everybody in the field assumed, I think it's over, actually over 100 years. It is assumed that those and the cones are only totally separate <laughs> in the retina or in the eye. However, there are more and more evidence, better in the last, I think in the last five, 10 years, uh, start to challenge this road and the cones problem. For example, patients with severe road and the There's additional class for the receptor besides your component. The main counter argument is that, oh yes, there is severe degeneration, but what if the remaining few for the receptors are capable of mediate the response? And especially in RD and MI, they still have some things for the receptors. In 1999, Russell Foster still had a Also, this is this measurement to so another kind of non meaningful from the pulmonary magnetic mass with slime mass. So, the y axis is the pupil area, which means the zero means pupil is counted widely open in the dark. 100 means counted from 50. So, the water type of oh, the x axis is really intensity of the light given the red. So, this is the y axis. And the same group went ahead, measured spectral sensitivity, spatial vulnerability, to match the pupil wavelength to elicit it, to elicit this uh, pupillary light reflex. And they found the peak sensitivity is around 489 uh, in the blue light ring. And it's very different from what we know. Already from this kind of experiment, you can see it shows there's really indeed a class of novel photoreceptors in the inner retina, not 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 So uh, here it's really interesting because then after this discovery, people become very careful because you cannot really call the mice or even patient without all the number of really benign for the code. They have photoreceptors in the ganglion cells. They perform many functions as a photoreceptor. Another interesting thing is really, I think, in the early days, it was uncommon for clinicians to remove eyes of people with very. 
Redis Studio are uh, possibly separate generation because they think they uh, act as a source of infection, but they don't know by doing so they are removing a very important part of possibly that and maybe it's also important for the most of them. I think I will touch based on that in a few times. So then comes into also the very important year. There's a serious elegant study finally nailed down or identified those so-called intrinsic disposition written as that in the So this was a voted top ten, one of the top ten discoveries in 2002 by science at Michigan. So the first experiment was done by David Burson at the Brown University. Uh, the thinking identify the skunkina cells. Then he can record the skunkina cells to see whether they are really photosensitive without the organism. So, this is pretty remarkable. You can see this, this recording on the Subpopulation ganglion cells actually can respond to mice. And this is pretty interesting because when he submitted this paper to science, the science editor <laughs> denied the publication for a whole year because they still don't believe in this. So they worry this is something, this is something too new and the evidence is not sufficient. Until there's another paper I will introduce you in the next few slides by Ken Wyatt's lab at Hopkins with use of uh, genetic method to look out the man and also look in the how metric. You can map the axonal projection of those cells in the assay. Then the two paper published finally after one year struggle side by side. And then the other thing is very interesting. Those cells are very different from the traditional organ in the past. So the nice Exactly what you expect as a circadian for the receptors. And this MEA recording on those gamma cells, the MEA is basically a marked electro array. So now you use a chip, or now you do simultaneously record hundreds of gamma cells. This is an important technology because those cells are very sparse. It's very difficult to find them in the gamma cell. And this shows the total spike. that because they are also very slow, they need to be nice for a long time. This space is something very clear because it is best to measure <coughs> the retinal ingredient for a period of a long time period. So, and this property when it serves as a neural memory, long term life history, can be used by the human being. That's what I'm talking about. Much, much faster. So, the other thing is very
分儿。They don't have rod and cone in food. The rod and cone is not functional. So they have that's a very interesting implication because that suggests actually during pregnancy, babies produce the same strategy as later. The ganglion cells to synchronize with outside sonar days. One before the rod and cone. And also, those non-image formulation actually are more aging than the image formulation. So the other really important uh, discovery is really to try to nail down the photopigment in the system because in all the photo detection data are on the retina. You really rely on photopigment, which has two essential parts. Another surprising finding is that the monoxin actually is more similar to invertebrate oxygen than vertebrate oxygen. And this is important, this is spread in SDN projecting retinal ganglion cells. So in the mouse small cow, in the mouse left in the they have defect in the non-image formulation, for example, incomplete signal analysis. Also, a defect in the for the entertainment. So, this is a recording found by the other person. You can see the melanoxin is a compromise, which is not found, but one melanoxin is more powerful, can be seen as the new photosynthesis. And this is, by using this is really a geometric method, we need to map out the axonal projection. So when they did is looking at how the gene mark in the melanoxin nucleus or now they will treat the axon fiber to get into the brain. So you can see with other two eyes, they project into the SDN. We actually we see a binary in the region. So this is one zoom is the individual fiber to the SDN. And this is in the labeling. You can see the cells are actually pretty sparse. You can see they got so much about one percent of the ganglion cells. And but they distribute throughout the entire retina. And the pigment density is also known. And this is very important. Remember, the light has to pass through the ganglion cell first before it reach rods and cones. So this, this distribution and this sparse density on the cells are now the light getting through the ganglion cells without the interfere with the rods and the cone uh, image, the so-called image formulation. Because if not too dense, they have too much light then your cone function will be affected. And it's a very smart and clever design. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I won't go into the details, but using the same technology with genetics, they map out of projecting the cells to give a number of green regions and it has a very important functional implication. These are the main are uh, the major sites of projection that's in IPL, important specific and training as you mentioned on the very important for pulmonary constriction. Uh, this is very interesting for theory of dynamic business. So this is important for major section. I think Catherine is going to talk about uh, this later. There's a minor side you have. There's not really, but what I want to think out is the actual project the source of matter emission is business. But this is really for image So it's very interesting. And then also VLTO so I already mentioned those cells, very important. They have major innovation for the uh, SN. They play a dominant role for the circadian for the entertainment. The other thing, very important for pigmentary night is that you can see in the melanoxin local, in the under very bright night, the wire type concrete is very well, but they have to cover the concrete all the way to minimum. They have in incomplete constriction. This is needed mainly by rods and cones, but the rods and cones seem to have a thinning for the constriction mechanism. 
and other basic recognition, but this is pretty new uh, uh, finding. This is just recently controlled by two measurement lines of atomic static. The beginning one is depending on the clock, the internal clock, the 24 hour cycle. The other clock is independent, and that's talk about nice or good molecular speed. So the thermal speed in the internal animals are increased or not increased in diameter species. And in the monoxynol cardamide, they use the two of them to conduct their functional, and they have to serve the parent in the response to light. So their sleep resolution was scrub pretty bad. Okay. And after the discovery of those <coughs> normal continental cells, it is natural for people to ask, so okay, maybe there's another additional photoreceptive system in the retina. So it makes the case. And this is addressed, again, with the genetic approach by putting all three systems at once. So in this is for signal polymer. So in triple knockout, you can see in the control, darkness, the people the white milk and grimy, the control is a very small size. The triple knockout it doesn't matter how strong the light, they don't respond. So, okay. so that's a really that that is real or for nine months. Now you can see with the controls again with the actions one, the controls synchronize very well well with the dark night back in the night space, even strong, dark space are active, but this is the signal. They are counted very long. They don't care what the outside they are dark and night space. So they lose the opportunity to synchronize to the outside. <coughs> so all this suggests that there's no additional photoreceptive system. Okay. And this is actually reported on monkeys, so it's very similar to what happened in humans. They just map out the improving range of the three systems. The, the dark depth of three systems are functional, light of depth is the <coughs> number of draws response, and then light of depth is the magic mode, so the range of both draws, and uh, the so the was are most sensitive at a specific range, the tone at a bright range, the melanoma in the head and overlap in the meridian range. And this is, I just briefly mentioned, it's very interesting. I already mentioned that the melanoma are actually more similar to invertebrate pigment. And when people start to work on the photo transaction mechanism, this is still under very active research of the small computer. But there are two major transaction mechanisms. One is for the rapid marriage, the humanity can fly for coconut, and the other similarly in the and home. So the fly one both use the photo treatment, but the fly one has five stages of treatment, part of the digital family, a PRP, part of the kids channel. But it was at home, the photo treatment, a digital, a part of the TV, and the DMP as a second messenger. To a CGMP gated canon channel. So, all the evidence so far suggests that those cells actually use an invertebrate for the transaction mechanism. It's a very, very fascinating. And then, uh, I just read a very recent article. It's the title is Manopsin by Stability of Smart uh, Eye Technology in Human Retina. So, pretty interesting. And this, I just mentioned once that it has come out pretty new. So I talked about image information, non image information. The road and cones was IPR gated. But, you know, I don't want to give you the idea that exclusively road and cones for image information, IPR is for non image information, because they have certain overlaps. One example is clear is that you can say they still also have some role in image information. So I talked about the axonal position of SDN. Of the non immune formulation being centric, but also in this case, they suggest to the ELGN and the serial commissioners, and those are really important centers for immune formulation. So, this uh, uh, is the water part with the double normal line. So, this is what I'm going to say. Only those gambling cells are functional. So, the mice was announced to swim towards a hidden platform with a procedure to monitor. Well, we 
jump to open source. So uh, this my take on this is that it doesn't mean you can walk around without the open source. That's not what it suggests. What it suggests those cells have some unique role in modulate image from me, which but Rosan Kongs is really the dominant one. So this is also very new, but I just want to mention briefly, uh, it has pretty important implications for the new disease. For example, for the regulation of methylene headache by HIV disease, testing the work. And also, the recent study is very interesting. In the RP patients, those cells are actually very resistant to degeneration. But in glaucoma patients, okay, so uh, in both human patients, in animal models, they found they actually, in their case, they have more with ICR disease. And then, of course, they have sleep disorders, pulmonary reflex problems. Uh, also, their mutation may not They have trouble to sleep, and one theory now emerging to think maybe we can develop this system to make it function. Okay. I have a stop here. So um, I think Ingbin has really brought us to a point here to understand that these cells are really different. Uh, they respond to blue light. They project to that superior chiasmatic nucleus, which really uh, um, uh, takes on an importance in our understanding of the uh, of sleep and our circadian rhythms. And uh, and so I'm going to cover two aspects because we I won't have time to cover more, but I'm going to talk a little bit about light sensitivity and this uh, finding of how melanopsin may actually relate to migraine. And so this, uh, uh, the suprachiasmatic nucleus really affects uh, our circadian rhythms. We've got photic and non-photic or image and non-image uh, clues. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about the pupillary light reflex, and then I'm going to talk about um, how this pathway may actually interfere with uh, uh, pain and migraine. So the first thing I want to talk about is photophobia. And, and you know, uh, Brad Katz did a wonderful talk on photophobia and on uh, blepharospasm and FL41 tint, but I'm going to use this as light sensitivity with a sense of pain, because that's what our patients report when light hits their eyes, there is a sense of pain. And it's been relegated into the functional diseases of the eye category, and all the people that come in with sunglasses, they're told, oh boy, here comes another crazy into our clinic. Well, uh, I would, I'm going to hopefully by the end of this talk, or at the end of this, you'll at least see that they're not completely uh, crazy. We're very tuned into um, anterior causes of light sensitivity. I mean, today we heard about this corneal problem, and his problem was photophobia. And we're, and we're clued into the posterior causes when people have inflammation of the eye, or if they have pain with eye movements or uh, uh, photophobia with optic neuritis. And there certainly are brain causes of photophobia like meningitis and blepharospasm. And there are psychiatric causes of photophobia like agoraphobia, depression, and then a, a host of other things can be uh, with uh, photophobia. We actually looked at all the cases of photophobia in our clinic here at Moran, and migraine and dry eyes were the two most frequent. Um, migraine more in women, dry eyes both in men and women, and then a whole host of other conditions, trauma, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, which actually is a uh, symptom of that disease. That's a Parkinsonian symptom, depression. And we looked at children, um, and children, by and large, did not get diagnosed for the cause of photophobia, although migraine and dry eyes were still uh, the most common. So the most common cause of photophobia in general is migraine. And migraine has photophobia as one of its key features. So any of you who's had a migraine knows that light sensitivity with pain, and it can accentuate your pain, is key to the migraine experience. And almost, um, and, and light can 
trigger people's migraine attacks. And uh, people with migraine are more light sensitive just in general than the normal population. We've shown that blepharospasm patients have a similar light sensitivity uh, and they have very poor light tolerance that's very similar to migraine headaches as well. So the question is, why might melanopsin be involved in photophobia? And one of the things is that people who have very poor formed vision actually can be severely light sensitive. Think about your patients with retinitis pigmentosa or cone dystrophy. Another line of evidence is that the melanopsin wavelength, as Ingben has told us, is 484 nanometers, which is blue light. And if you do a spectrum of light for human beings, blue light is the least, sens uh, is the least comfortable light that people uh, experience. And interestingly, blue light activates different areas of the brain. And in this thing, you can see that it's activating into the brain stem, uh, into the hippocampus, amygdala, and thalamus. So there's something about this blue light uh, uh, that actually is very, very important. Now, uh, well, for years, people thought in order to be light sensitive, you had to have vision. But in 1920, uh, Sigwart reported that in 46 patients, he had three patients who had, uh, uh, who had light sensi sensitivity despite being blind. Um, then there was another series of light sensitivity and blind painful eyes. And then the article that I'm gonna spend a lot of time on by Rosetta um, and Ronnie Burstein in Boston, we were able to participate and actually have patients in, from my practice that um, had migraine, uh, were legally visually blind, but had severe light sensitivity. And um, we found that the people who had either their eyes were missing uh, or they had absolutely no light perception, um, uh, they had no light sensitivity with their migraine. But if they had any type of light perception, they all had light sensitivity with their attacks. And interesting also, the people who lost their eyes had these problems with their circadian rhythm, the people who still had their eyes were able to contain, continue to have a circadian rhythm. So the answer is you don't need vision to be light sensitive. How would the discomfort occur? Well, it has to come from the pain system that serves the brain and the eye, uh, which is the trigeminal system. And while we all learn in medical school that the trigeminal system Uh, you know, the maxillary division, the mandibular division, but actually the, the uh, trigeminal system also, the first division, supplies all the meninges of the brain. And uh, so that this system, this trigeminal system, it, which goes also into the brain stem, is really the pain-forming pathway uh, for the eye and for light sensitivity. Our current understanding of migraine is this, that people inherit brains that are sensitive to light, that there is this connection with the meninges that set up the loop of neural transmitters that affect blood vessels that then have uh, afferents that go into the trigeminal system, go into the brain stem. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is gonna be very reminiscent of what you're gonna see uh, in the melanopsin system. And that we experience pain partly because of this meningeal uh, um, dural afferent input into the trigeminal systems that then affect the, um, is this a pointer? Um, that the trigeminal systems that then uh, are, are this, is a, this is part of the trigeminal nucleus caudalis that goes actually into the brain stem. So this paper which um, came out um, this spring uh, was the first paper to demonstrate that these intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells actually connect to the trigeminal system in the brain stem. And that there is this retinal thalamic pathway um, that goes to the pretectal region uh, where these trigeminal afferents occur. Now this diagram looks a little bit confusing, but it really isn't. Um, so here, that what Dr. Burstein in his laboratory did 
was stimulate the dura and find the pain sensitive areas of the dura. Then he put light in the eye of these laboratory animals and, um, and found there were certain cells that lit up just to light, not to mechanical stimulation, chemical stimulation, or anything else, just light. Uh, and then he was able to record in the brainstem, especially in this posterior thalamic area, these areas that were both dural sensitive, meaning coming from the dura, the trigeminal system, into the brainstem, and light sensitive at the same time. And then he found some that were just dura sensitive, and then he found places that were insensitive to both light and sound. So these recordings showed us that these cells then connect in the midbrain in amphalamus in this posterior thalamic region uh, in these uh, anesthetized animals. What was even more exciting is that the latency and the way these spikes occur are very characteristic of melanopsin firing. So look at this. Here comes the light on, and it took a while for the spikes to start being generated, but even after the light goes off, the uh, spikes keep coming. And that's very typical of these melanopsin ganglion cells. It takes them a lot to get going, but once they get going, they do not turn off. And so, um, and this really kind of correlates with our patients who get horribly light sensitive for whatever region with migraine, and it's impossible to turn that light sensitivity off. Then anatomically, he was able to show that the trigeminal nerve cells within this posterior thalamic area actually connected anatomically with the intrinsically light sensitive retinal ganglion cells so that there was actually axo axodendritic and axosomatic connections in this region so that there's actually an anatomic connection to the pain. Then he traced um, these cells to both the somatosensory uh, parts of the brain and the visual parts of the brain. So, and then there were other parts that had some connections as well. And he put together this diagram where the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells uh, project by, via the optic nerve to this posterior thalamic region which also receives input from the trigeminal system and that these two can connect and then go to the cortex where people could actually experience pain, experience light sensitivity. And in this editorial that accompanied this article, this is a very nice diagram that, that light goes in. And that diagram I showed you of migraine, you can see how that similar this is that, that uh, the, these trigeminal, this light sensitivity pathway is uh, uh, connecting with our trigeminal afferents from the, from the dura and shows a pathway whereby in migraine headache people can have their light sensitivity and pain actually worsened by light um, and that this is one of the um, uh, keys to understanding uh, migraine. So uh, I would just say in, for photophobia, this is a common symptom. I think that melanop uh, that it may not be the only pathway to the development of photophobia, but it's certainly part of it. And um, especially in these patients who have no form vision, we know this has to be part of it. And I'm sure that the rod and cone pathway is also connecting in some way to these trigeminal uh, afferents as well. And Brad had a nice talk about using the FL41 tint as a blue blocking lens to assist these people with uh, photophobia. For the last couple minutes, I just want to mention, uh, Ingvin also mentioned this, about the pupillary constriction uh, and some studies that have just come out this year and last year about melanopsin in the pupillary pathway. So if you shine light into somebody's eyes, we get a, a constriction of the pupil. Well, if you just watch carefully, you'll see that this somewhat escapes so that the pupil constricts and then there's a little bit of an escape. Um, and then if you hold the light on there, there's kind of a sustained pupillary uh, constriction. And then if you turn the light off, the pupils will dilate. Well, what was found was that they were trying to explain why would people have a pupillary light reflex if they had no rods and cones. And so um, these were some studies done by Randy Carden that showed that um, if you just shine a red stimulus in somebody's eyes, a normal person, they will, an and a blue stimulus, at different intensities, you'll get different pupillary 
uh, light reflexes. So if you shine a very weak stimulus, you'll get a response in both um, uh, in, in the pupillary light reflex. Uh, at, but as you get to the stronger uh, uh, intensity light, it's more sustained, especially with the blue light. Now, um, this, this um, case, however, really uh, brought home that this melanopsin pathway must be working. So here's a case of a unilateral retinitis pigmentosa patient who had those different light intensity lights, both red and blue stimulus, shined into their eyes. In the normal eye, they had a normal response, just like I showed you on the previous slide. In the eye with the photoceptor regeneration, the red light produced no pupillary constriction whatsoever. But the brightest blue light gave a nice sustained response and pupillary constriction. And so this actually uh, was used by uh, Randy Carden at Iowa and several others uh, in his group to show that probably you could almost divide up people's light response by colored light. So a light blue uh, response uh, is mainly the rod response. A high intensity red response is more cone. And then this high intensity blue response is more melanopsin. And so that we now know that the pupillary light reflex is not just input from rods and cones into the pretectal area, but the melanopsin pathway is also playing a role. And it may help us understand phenomenon like the Flynn phenomenon, you know, where you turn the lights off and the pupil actually is constricted. Maybe it, it's this continuous melanopsin firing that can continue to constrict the pupil uh, after you actually turn the lights off. Um, and so we would like to, uh, we, th we wanted this to link the basic science with our clinical phenomenon, and we'd like to turn the lights on and let Ingrid come up here and answer questions about these intrinsically photoactive ganglion cells. <laughs> Any questions? I mean, I think this is really exciting work, and. Um, it really, it's, it's kind of like in the pupil world, it sort of blew up all the pupil mavens. Uh, and in the light <laughs> sensitivity world, I think it's done the same. Yeah. What did you know about the pathway? Another light response pathway. You had to talk about the photic sneeze response. Okay, the photic sneeze response is somewhat, uh, it, it's an interesting one. It goes to the brain stem. And like photic blink, it's part of the brain stem. Uh, circuitry. I don't know if melanopsin is involved in the photic sneeze response. Um, I mean, I haven't seen those little mice with all their uh, melanopsin to see if they can sneeze yeah. or not. You know, but that's another. It's another pathway. But just like the photic blink response, which we know is involved with blepharospasm, it's probably in that same brainstem area because sneezing comes out of the brainstem. Yeah. Well, from a from a photophobia point of view, uh, I don't I don't know yet. Uh, how about a molecular point of view? Can you think of a way that you might be able to affect melanopsin on a molecular level if somebody were? Uh, but you don't want to wipe out your melanopsin no. cells. You wipe out your circadian rhythm, and right. as you get older, you lose a lot of that anyway. And That's an interesting point that because those ganglion cells are not homogeneous. I don't have time to talk about, but they are fairly heterogeneous. They have five subclasses, and each one predicts so maybe different areas, and then if each one has different sensitivity, light sensitivity, some more sensitive. So it's quite possible 
still different than the Cibonite or Monipine with different kind of fun glasses. I, I think it's possible. It's still early in time. But the other thing I want to raise up is that it's very interesting phenomenon I think we can do here in the Moran because every time when you walk, when your eyes are dark or depth from movie theater, when you walk out in the sunlight, when you open your eyes, it's very painful. Every time you open your eyes in the bright night, it's very painful. So I think the man of the may or zero in there, you know, you know just rotten cone, but how to dissect the rotten cone input versus the man of the input. What is the mechanism? It's a very common mechanism, it's not occurred in disease, but in everyday life, when you walk from a dark place in a bright night, it, it is painful. condition <laughs> uh, it's still early. Uh, what they know is they call it M1, M2, M3, maybe an additional one, but in both rodents and the primates. So, and then people also know each of them have very different sensitivity. So the M1 has high sensitivity, very, the density pigment is very high, and then they predict the different sublaminates of the uh, IPL, just above the gangrenous cells, so they have different physiological functions, but they just come out maybe in the last year. Yeah, so, but it's, it's very interesting. So, okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Do you want to vote down on your talk and my talk on the disc drive and then uh, uh, Alicia to put on the intranet, oh, not okay. our okay. internet, but intranet? Dr. Um, Degree, so what, what am I going to lose that under? Uh, is it under neural? Basic uh, retinal basic anatomy, uh, right. okay. and then under neuro, put it under pupil. Yeah.